This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. How's the economy doing? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, Reason Senior Producer, joined by my co-host Liz Wolf, Reason Associate Editor and author of The Reason Roundup. Hi, Liz. Hey, Zach. In 2022, economists forecasted that we'd be in a recession right now. Did it ever actually happen, though? Prices got higher, interest rates ticked up, but mass layoffs never really happened and GDP growth chugged on. People mostly weathered the turbulence. So joining us today to talk about all that and to speculate on what effects Trump and Harris's proposals might have on the economy is Kyla Scanlon. She worked as a macroeconomic analyst at Capital Group before founding Bread, a financial education company. And she built a large social media following teaching finance and economics via YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. Let's take a quick look at one right now explaining the debt ceiling. The United States might default on its debt, and here are some solutions so we don't do that. The debt ceiling allows the government to borrow money so it can pay the obligations that already exist. It's funded via taxes and bonds, and taxes are not enough to cover spending right now. Tax receipts through April have been less than the CBO anticipated, and now it looks like the government could run out of money in June. The first solution is a discharge petition. It needs to be signed by 218 House members and would force a vote on the clean debt ceiling increase. However, it requires the signatures of five House Republicans, and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy does not want that to happen. Biden could invoke Section 4 of the 14th Amendment, stating that the validity of the public debt of the United States shall not be questioned. Biden could also direct the Treasury to mint a $1 trillion platinum coin to put on deposit at the Fed that would then credit the Treasury for the coin, netting out the debt. The Treasury could also do some financial engineering to issue premium bonds. But as Yellen said, things need to get sorted out. McCarthy and Biden are meeting May 9th, so hopefully things get less stupid. (laughs) Lots to cram in there, but uh, it's impressive. Kyla's recently published her first book in, in this economy, How Money and Markets Really Work. Kyla Scanlon, thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Let's start with the recession issue. Um, as we came out of the pandemic, we experienced inflation beyond what millennials have seen in their lifetimes. The Federal Reserve hiked interest rates to try to go for that soft landing Uh, using the power of the central bank to cool a hot economy without causing a recession. We're in election year now. How do you think voters should perceive the current state of our economy? Yeah, I mean, I think so on the day of recording, Friday, August 23rd, we got actually a lot of information about the economy from Chair of the Fed, Jerome Powell, who did highlight that the labor market is indeed weakening, something that we've known for the past couple of months and that inflation is headed in the right direction. And so I think most Americans are noticing you know, weakness in the labor market. They're probably noticing somewhat of a slowdown in inflation, but of course, most things are not deflating in price. Prices are still extraordinarily high. So I think there's definitely more signs of concern right now than we had this time a year ago. But luckily, the Federal Reserve will probably begin their rate cutting cycle at their September meeting, and hopefully that will um, prevent any further labor market weakening. How is it that we got into this mess in the first place? The pandemic. Yeah. The pan- are you just referring to the, the sort of strange economic situation where, I mean, essentially we had super, super high inflation, um, the likes of which we haven't seen in a really long time. And then, you know, it makes sense that the Fed would respond in the way that they did hiking interest rates. But like, how did we get into this inflationary state? Like, how do you explain it to your viewership? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of academic research that points to the pandemic being a primary cause of inflation. I think it's sort of tough because prior to 2020, you did have a Federal Reserve that was not able to get out of a quantitative easing cycle. Like every time that they tried to hike rates, the market would respond relatively negatively. Um, And so I think like, you know, we had easy money policy for quite a long time. And uh, the pandemic really just exacerbated inflation. And a lot of the inflation that has abated has been because supply chains have normalized, as Chair Powell pointed out in his speech today. So I think that's been primarily the cause. Other people might point to price hikes by major corporations as, you know, (laughs) probably leading to some components of inflation. But a, a big part of it was the supply disconnect. 
Well, but okay. So two things on that. One would like, I always find the price hikes by major corporations thing to be not especially airtight. You can correct me if I'm wrong there, but it's not as if, you know, major grocery chains just discovered greed or something along those lines. Right. And like, to me, that explanation always falls short. What do you make of it? Yeah, I'm not arguing for it. I'm just pointing out that some people do think that's the case. I mean, I think that when you talk to people about that, they'll bring up Dr. Isabel Weber and her research on seller's inflation and how, you know, corporations are opportunistic, <laughs> as anybody would be. Like if I was running a major corporation, I would look at for chances to probably raise prices because that's how you, you know, make money as a corporation. And they've also been dealing with inflation as well and higher labor costs. And so I think that's what some people will say in response to the line that corporations are not greedy, is corporations might not be greedy, but they're opportunistic. And they will raise prices if they have the opportunity to do so. And I think oh, it's not necessarily the grocery stores. I know that price gouging is in the news right now. It's really the manufacturers, like Campbell Soup raised prices by 16% in the first quarter of 2023. You know, you did have these major suppliers raising prices and grocery stores have no choice but to pass that cost off. At one point, Walmart was <laughs> investing heavily in their generic brands to try and prevent consumers from having to deal with the price hikes of Campbell Soup, Nestle, Kraft, et cetera. That's so interesting. The other thing that I think about a lot, and naturally, since I'm a libertarian, this is a very convenient explanation for inflation, but I also think that it might, in fact, be true. Um, but is the pandemic stimulus checks. They played a massive role in inflation by pumping so much money into our economy. Uh, what do you make of that? And how much like, how much is that specific thing to blame for the inflationary environment that we're in? There's research from the San Francisco Federal Reserve that does highlight that stimulus checks did increase demand and therefore did have inflationary pressure. I, you know, I think that you can look at giving people a check and it's probably going to lead to some elements of inflation, right? Um, I don't know if it was the primary, I don't, it doesn't seem, according to the research, that was the primary cause of inflation. And I think the thing with stimulus checks is it did manage to offset a recession. So if you look at other developed economies comparative to the US, like Europe, they've had a much harder time sustaining economic growth because the fiscal policy wasn't as supportive. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, some portion of our audience is, comes from the Austrian School of Economics and their take on inflation is that it is a monetary phenomenon, that it is essentially when the government monetize, as monetizes the debt and, uh, you know, causes the central bank to issue more money, more money goes into circulation and then the dollar is becomes less valuable. So your purchasing power goes down. How does that story square with how you look at things? Yeah, I mean, nobody likes when I say there's research showing, but there's research showing that that isn't always necessarily the case. I think that's a super tough line to walk because, you know, obviously if there's more money entering the economy through supportive monetary policy that does tend to put an upward pressure on prices because it can improve demand. Um, so it's not something that I ascribe to, and I don't think that's what we saw with this reset inflation um, situation that we were in. But if some people believe that, that, that works for them. Uh, one thing that you uh, have written a lot about, and I believe you actually coined this term, is the, I'm going to bring this on stage, the role of vibes. The vibe session is what you have called uh, some aspects of what we went through in recent years. What is the uh, and in your this uh, this is a page I pulled from your book. You actually say that vibes are the economy. What do you mean by yeah. that? Yeah, so it, it really is just the idea that sentiment is an extraordinarily part of extraordinarily extraordinarily important part of the economy. Jerome Powell even highlighted inflation expectations in his speech today and how the Federal Reserve really pays attention to the direction that people think inflation is going to go, because ultimately what people think is going to happen with the economy can oftentimes turn into a self-fulfilling prophecy. Consumer spending is 70% of GDP. So if you, if the, hypothetically, if people are feeling bad about the economy, they choose not to spend. We have an economic slowdown just based on quote unquote vibes. And so the book was really just meant to be a people-centric approach to understanding economics. 
Um, and that's why Vibes was a big part of that discussion. It, I, you know, we, we've got the consumer sentiment here, uh, a graph showing consumer sentiment. Um, is this uh, one empirical way to sort of measure vibes? Um, like what, what does this graph mean to you? Yeah, this is definitely one way to measure vibes. I would say that the University of Michigan has been a little bit tough to parse because they recently switched from phone calls to web-based surveys. And so the data methodology has actually made it really confusing to figure out, you know, what's accurate in terms of the sentiment. Of course, you have consumer confidence measures um, or conference board measures as well. And so that's useful to compare. But um, a lot of the vibes are mostly anecdotal and yeah, it's, it's quite confusing to ascribe, you know, purely quantitative meaning to them. But they're just important to pay attention to because right now we're in a very much vibes-based election. Social media makes it so sentiment can dictate conversation more so than fact. And so I think it's just, you know, when we talk about the economy, we should consider that as well. Well, what break that down for us a little bit more? Like when you're talking about vibes, I would imagine housing prices uh, play a big part in it, both rent and uh, prices, you know, for for homes available for purchase. I would imagine labor market, how easy it is getting a job, how many people around you are getting fired or laid off from their jobs. Like break it down. What exactly are the vibes that people are picking up on? Yeah. So usually when I talk about this topic, I talk about two main things. Number one being structural affordability. Um, so how people feel about you know their housing situation or their ability to get a job is going to massively influence how they feel about the economy at large. And that doesn't always show up in economic metrics. Like people can be really worried about their housing situation, but we still have like really strong GDP, right? And so I think that's, you know, one big thing. Elder care costs are really expensive. Healthcare costs, child care costs, you know, home insurance is a crisis within itself. And so you have all these things that are extraordinarily problematic that contribute to the vibes that might not show up in economic data. Sure. And then the second thing would be media headlines. So there's quite a few studies, you know, showing that media sentiment has trended negative over time. It's the business model of media, you know, they have to have clicks. And so they're going to have negative headlines. And I think that will oftentimes influence how people absorb information about the world. So we had um, Nate Silver on the show a couple weeks ago, and we'll make sure to link that episode in the description. Um, and what one economic metric that he says is particularly important for when considering elections is this one that uh, called real disposable personal income. Apparently, over the years, there's a really strong correlation between that number and whether the incumbent party gets reelected or not. And his forecast here shows that currently it's uh, down 0.68% and will be projected down 0.75% by November, according to his projections. Um, what Could you just explain what that means? What is real disposable personal income and why might that have a uh, sort of outsized effect on the vibes. Yeah. No, it's it's not surprising that we're seeing that. Like part of the labor market data that we have been seeing is that, you know, wage growth is slowing down too um, and, and incomes haven't really kept up with inflation. And that's kind of what that is um, describing. And so I think that that makes sense that that number would influence elections, how people feel about their purchasing power and what they're able to buy. Uh, they're yeah. probably not going to want to keep the same party in power that they felt hasn't been able to, you know, allow them to go to the grocery store and purchase what they want. So um, I, I think it's it's been a tough labor market situation because real wages have been strong, wages adjusted for inflation, um, and they have outpaced inflation. Uh, but I just don't think it's been enough for people because we had a, decades of stagnant real wage growth before real wages started picking up. And so I think mm. a lot of the problems that we're running into right now, and I don't know if Nate talks about this in the podcast that you all did with them, him is uh, just everything is a pressure cooker. And so people are dealing with the compounded effects of having slow wage growth for decades, um, for having issues with healthcare, for having issues with housing, for having you know 
for the first time in a very long time. This is research out of Harvard from Stephanie Stanchiba. Upward mobility in the U.S. has declined. And so I think it, you know, I don't know if you can ascribe an election to just one number. I'd caution against that. But there's a lot of things out there that point to people are not feeling good. And you have to, you know, really look at those metrics and figure out how to fix them. Oh, is that a recent development in upward mobility? Because my understanding has been was that upward mobility has for decades con continued to be on an upward trajectory. Where, where are you getting that from? Yeah, so it's a research out of Harvard from Stephanie Stancheva. And this paper, I believe, was published in April of this year. I can link it for your audience if that's useful. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. Do you have any um, idea, hold on, do you have any idea like how they came to that conclusion or, or how they're measuring that? Um, I don't know the specifics of the methodology, but they get it. It's a research paper peer reviewed. So. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, there was this other report that came out of the Bureau of Labor Statistics where they revised the job numbers down by uh, over 800,000, which uh, I, I guess the, it's very it's common for them to make revisions. But that was a particularly large one, which is another you know, bad metric to, to be seeing. What's uh, could you just explain that process and you know what that means for the economy? Um, you know, I'll zoom out for a second. I, I've talked a lot about economic data being not good in terms of measuring the economy. You know, one of the main labor market metrics that the Federal Reserve looks at is JOLTS, the Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey. It's a survey. People are not responding to it anymore. The response rate is down to about 30%. And so if you're using that to gauge the success of the labor market, it's extraordinarily difficult to do so because it's a survey that people aren't responding to. And so mm. I think we have a lot of um, metrics that are like that, like the current population survey is another good example where the data is just like extraordinarily wonky um, and isn't telling the entire story. Um, immigration numbers are another good example. And so this labor market revision that happened, this is totally normal. They revise these metrics every single year. It's because it was a survey. So the, they were looking at payroll surveys, collecting the data, um, and then they get some updated tax numbers and they update you know, what, the, what these numbers are actually supposed to be. And so once you go from a survey to actual concrete numbers, the number is going to change. There's a lot of speculation about why the revision was so large. You know, Revising downward um, 818,000 is huge. Um, and so I think that people are looking at the BLS and saying like, what happened? Um, but I do think it's just a sign that the economic data that we oftentimes use is not perhaps impactful because of maybe issues with surveys. There was also issues with the birth death model. Um, lots of people are dying and that's not necessarily captured the right way. And so it was just- How so? How I don't that? know the details, yeah. So just, I know the surface level, a lot of stuff. But um, Ernie Tedeschi, who used to be the head of the CEA, wrote about, you know, this, this issue, the issues with the birth death model. But it, a little bit absurd about the fact that, like, as we deal with, you know, greater proliferation of, like, like it's easier to mass message than ever before. We have greater technology than ever before. And yet we're running into all kinds of issues with actually getting a clear snapshot of what's going on in our economy and how many people are in our country. Yeah. It's, I think that makes sense, though. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's an argument that as an economy gets more dynamic and complex, yeah. it gets harder to measure. Yeah. And the sort of Hayekian read on that is then, well, then you need to have simpler and simpler rules and policies applied to the economy because you, the, the models are just going to be more and more flawed the more complex you get. Um, do you buy any of that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think you see this with home insurance right now where the, the risk models that we have on a lot of homes are just, they don't work. And we have massively underpriced risk in so many different parts of the country. Two, a, two out of every three Americans are underinsured on their homes. You cannot have a mortgage if you don't have home insurance. And so I think there's like, that's just a very nuanced example of a model not necessarily working, but I definitely yeah. think that can apply to the broader economy. <laughs> when we bring this to the context of the, back to the context of the election, um, the, you know, H Harris is running in a sense on Bidenomics. And, uh, you know, Biden has touted Bidenomics as 
a large success. Um, Trump obviously thinks uh, is painting it as a complete failure. Um, what is first? I guess all. First of all, I guess how do you view Bidenomics? Like, what does that mean as a term? Yeah, I think Bidenomics obviously is like the economic plan of President Biden and, and what he set out to achieve during his presidency. And so when I kind of think of Bidenomics, I think of the CHIPS Act, the IRA, the IAJA. I think those were the some of the most successful um, things that he was able to get done during his time as president. I think that's probably what the legacy of Bidenomics will be. So a lot of infrastructure spending. Manufacturing, yeah. Manufacturing. Um, I mean, would you, cons you say that you'd consider those successful aspects of his economic agenda. In what ways were they successes? Um, you know, they did contribute a lot of jobs to the economy. It's also important with the CHIPS Act that we kind of bring some semiconductor manufacturing into the United States and invest in companies that are doing semiconductor manufacturing. Um, so I think that was a, a big part of it. The Inflation Reduction Act, um, some people argue if it was success or not, but it definitely got a lot of good stuff done. And then, um, yeah, I, I would say that most of those policies achieved what they set out to do. The only problem with them is they ended up being inflationary. Um, That's a huge that, problem, right? That, well, well, sort of. I mean, I, I think it's like there's trade-offs, right? Obviously, like yeah. with economies and the trade-off here was economic growth. So. Wouldn't another trade-off be this, um, the national debt? Um, this is federal debt held by the public. We can see kind of the 2020 spike that happened there. Um, and now in the red box here, I'm showing Biden's debt. Um, there is an argument here that perhaps, uh, you know, the at least this is the argument that the Trump team would make is that in the middle of the pandemic, we had to have this, this uh, insane spike in public spending, but then Biden kind of threw fuel onto the fire. And not only did it create inflation, it, it piled on this unsustainable debt so that we're now, you know, right around 100% of uh, debt to GDP ratio. Yeah, I mean, that to you. It is, it is concerning. I mean, I think the, the response of the Trump administration with the tax cuts and tariffs are going to be uh, contributing to that debt issue as well. Um, neither candidate has said pretty much anything on reducing the, the public debt. And I think the yep. concern is because, you know, Fed has been or was raising rates in order to battle inflation. Rates are really high right now. And um, the government has to pay interest rates, too. And so now you have interest on debt being a very big problem. Because I think if debt is used productively, it's not a bad thing. Like if you take out a loan to build up a small business, comparing the government to a small business, which some people don't like, but it can be useful. But if you take out a loan to build up a small business, that business does really well. That's good, productive debt. But if you're paying back interest um, and uh, you know that's where tax dollars are going, that's not a good use of debt. Yeah, we there was a whole decade where the mantra coming from a lot of the economics profession, honestly, was that debt does not the debt doesn't matter very much because of that low interest rate environment. Uh, I do wonder if any of that has been reconsidered now because the kind of the point of maintaining a lower debt during the quote unquote good times would be so that you've, you know, you've got some dry powder there so when that pandemic hits that you're not now faced with this very situation we're faced with. Um, as an economist, have you noticed any sort of revision of priors uh, in your field uh, and how they think about that question? Uh, you haven't really heard a lot from MMT people <laughs> over the past few <laughs> Months. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, MT people is deafening right now. Yeah. And I, it's like, the, you know, if you're in an, we learned a lot of lessons about what works during ZERP and what doesn't work during ZERP. And I, I think that Can you explain ZERP for our audience. Yeah, zero interest rate phenomenon. Sorry. Yeah. So, like, basically, the Fed rates are low. That's why you saw this huge startup boom. Like, VCs were throwing money all around. It seemed like the government could also throw money all around. But once rates go up, reality sets in. And I think reality has set in 
to a certain extent for the government um, as well as startups. And so, I, I, yeah, it definitely there's not that. I think it's the kitchen sink where it's like you can just use taxes as the lever and, you know, issue as much debt as you want, something like yeah. that. I just don't think that model really works. I think fiscal austerity is going to have to be a point of conversation because right now we are taking on a lot of debt and not really thinking about what happens next. And we're facing a demographic crisis. <laughs> like yep. we're going to have a lot of boomers who are going to need extraordinary amounts of support, whether that comes from healthcare or 43% of boomers have no retirement savings. And we just don't have enough people entering the workforce to pay for that. Are you a pronatalist as a result of this concern? <laughs> like it should be. Well, I, you know, I, I think we should allow immigration. I think that's going to be the main way to to solve our problem. I don't think if everyone starts popping out babies, all of a sudden, like those babies will get right to work. That'll be a couple of decades. A little bit of a waiting period on that one. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think pro child labor and pro a mixture of <laughs> more, more baby having. And <laughs> no, uh, but I do think that this is an interesting thing to linger on for a second. Like this is, I think, uh, an issue that's very near and dear to my heart, but it's obviously something that bores people to tears when you trot it out at like a cocktail party, right? This idea of like the bill will come due and uh, we have to be somewhat concerned about debt and deficit because, you know, at a certain point, it, it feels like we're we have the luxury of ignoring that right now, and we've had the luxury of ignoring that for you know the last decade or two. But you know, we can't continue to bury our heads in the sand ten years, twenty years from now. How do you spice up this case, or how do you make this argument sexy and interesting to people to the point where they'll begin to care? Yeah, right. And people, my eyes glaze over when I talk about it too. Yeah. Because you're like advocating for the party ending, basically. And you're like, we can't yeah. have fun anymore. Like, we have to grow up. <clears throat> and I think that's just, that's hard. And when you look at fiscal austerity measures, like, they're tough because it's things like raising taxes and nobody yeah. likes that or, you know, spending less money. Spending. Or yeah. Cutting yeah. spending. Yeah, exactly. You know, that, that would be the two main levers. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> neither of those are popular. And so because the solutions weren't popular, the problem remains. But I, I do think that for younger generations, like we've been able to skirt around this because more people were entering the labor force, because we had a growing population, because people were having kids. But, you know, we have a fertility crisis. Childcare costs are really expensive. So people are like, I can't have a kid. We have issues with immigration. Um, and so it's kind of like across the board, all the problems are coalescing into one really big yeah. issue. Yeah. What does this imply for younger generations? Let's say millennials and younger, um, because what, if we talk about cutting spending, I mean, the big elephant in the room is the entitlements. You know, the uh, Social Security and Medicare is uh, a huge portion of the budget. Um, and, you know, the baby boomers are retiring every day. Uh, yeah. And that that's a big generation. So what in practical terms, how would you suggest millennials in the prime of their, you know, careers, um, Gen Z at the beginning of their careers or uh, early on in their careers, think about things or kind of change how they think about their place in the economy, given these realities? I mean, I wrote this piece yesterday, uh, Thursday, August 22nd, about home insurance because that's kind of like this canary in the coal mine for me. Like, I'm not a doomer by any capacity, but I do think that there's these concerning elements. And I think the entire American dream model is going to have to change. So I think mm -hmm. a lot of Gen Z and millennials are like looking toward buying a home as being the answer to wealth and kind of like a safe place to hang out. Um, I, I think that we're going to have to look at other wealth generation tools to like stocks and business ownership. But um, yeah, in terms of what they can do to prevent whatever might happen in the future, I don't quite know. And I wish I had a better answer for that because a lot of this just does come down to policy and responsibility to policy. And that's yeah. a difficult thing as an individual to achieve. And I think that's why we see elements of nihilism as well. Hmm. I've sort of long been interested just personally because I'm, I'm 28 years old. Um, I've 
owned, I'm tra transacted property a little bit. Like I've owned a home in Austin, Texas, and then Austin, Texas, that housing market has interestingly sort of corrected in a way that sets it apart from places like LA or San Francisco or New York. I'm also a renter in New York. So I like remotely, I'm a landlord of a property in Austin, but I'm a, a renter in my residence here. Um, and so I feel like I've spent a lot of time unpacking the premise, like the pros and cons of owning, but the the fundamental premise seems to be that home ownership is this, you know, massively symbolic thing in our American narrative, our American story. There's this sense that, um, you know, this is really just a, a huge vehicle for wealth building. This is sort of the way, and it, it's also a, a, a signifier. It's a it's a way of communicating to those around you that you're an adult or that you're ready to start a family or all of these things. Um, and it just it it's imbued with so much meaning in a way that renting is not. But I'm also fascinated by the Japanese housing market and real estate in Japan is looked at super, super differently than it is in the United States. Um, do you have any sort of grand theories about how home ownership and its centrality to wealth building in the American dream is going to change over the next 20, 30, 40 years? Yeah, I think the difference with Japan is the land increases in value. So the properties don't increase in value, but the land does. And so it's, it can be weird there too. But I mean, I think that like the, so I'm, I'm 27. So I'm kind of in the same boat as you, where it's like looking at homes and being like, can I, like, what can, what is this? And yeah. I think a lot of people, you know, one in every four Gen Z are homeowners, but 78% of those Gen Z have had financial support for the down payment from parents. Yeah. And so I think that's kind of very oh, cool. like, awesome. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I pulled I feel this like from your blog fast. here. Okay. And yeah, you know, the, <laughs> The interesting thing about, well, I mean, one thing that struck me about this, I I want to hear more about how this stat came to be, yeah. because when you look at where the lines begin, you see that Gen Z is starting out at a higher home ownership rate than either Gen X or millennials, um, not higher than, well, actually, I, guess, I don't know how far the baby boomer line is, uh, actually goes back, but uh, at least higher than uh, millennials and Gen X. Um, so are, you're saying that this is largely because of Synthetic. they're uh, more likely to receive some down payment assistance from mom and dad? What are you saying about synthetic bliss? Oh, I was just, I was saying what Zach was saying, which is like, is this generation that we're looking at, like, is the main reason why they're able to afford homeownership because of, um, you know, receiving payment, receiving down payment help from parents? That's what the surveys say. Okay. So, yeah, 78% of... Gen Z have support from mom and dad or grandma and grandpa. Uh, and that makes sense, right? Like that's kind of what you'd have to do, I think, for a lot of people because you just haven't had that many earning years. But well, the other possible vehicle, like I'm thinking about my situation, like I'm married and my husband's a few years older than me. And so he's had a longer span of earning years than I have. He makes way more than I do. But also like the dual income thing is like I would not be able to get approved for uh, the types of mortgage that I would want to be approved for on a journalist, uh, a 28 year old journalist salary. Right. And so but but that I think my story probably is not representative of other people's stories because we're seeing people push off getting married until way later. Yeah. No, so, it's yeah. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Well, no, I think, yeah. That, so to Zach's question about the, or maybe it was your question, somebody's question about the American dream and housing. Like, I just think it's going to yeah. change. Like people are getting married much later. They're not having kids at the same rate. Um, and, you know, in the 1990s, Americans used to live with their parents until they were like 23. And now the average age of leaving them is 26. And so, um, which I, I was really surprised by that statistic. It's average, so I think it's skewed. But um, we just, people are just living life a lot later. And maybe it's because we're living so much longer. But yeah, it's it's going to be really interesting. I just, I don't think home ownership is going to be the path to wealth. And that's going to be really difficult for people. There's another um, interesting bit of data you visualized here um, showing the assets by wealth percentile group. So that, that turquoise bar at the top there is real estate. And as you go down to people have less and less wealth, more and more of their wealth tends to be in real estate, in their homes. And once you're up to the top 0.1%, their portfolio is, you know, a very small portion of it is real estate. So what this shows to me or implies to me is that for, you know, the bottom 50% of wealth holders in America, their homes are a, 
are an investment. That's a big part of the, of, of their wealth. Um, at the same time, we have this issue where um, the houses are <laughs> too expensive for new, new uh, the, as many Gen Zers and millennials to get into the market as they want to. How do you resolve that paradox? Resolve the paradox of making housing affordable or well, the fact wealth. that housing is both a, a place where you live uh, and that in a sense, I don't know, it just feels like there's strong incentives for house housing to go up and go down. Like it's almost like politically um, we kind of want both. And we can't have it properly. Yeah. It's both right. a speculative asset and a place to raise your kids. And I, I just, I don't think those two things can be reconciled. And homes, yeah. like, they didn't increase at this pace until, I want to say the 1980s was really when they started to see homes just skyrocket in value and for people to use them as kind of a retirement plan. Um, and so I, I don't think that this can continue. I don't know what's going to happen with house prices moving forward. You know, um, Harris has put forward her economic proposals, which include building 3 million homes, and that should help with uh, perhaps affordability, but that's going to take a long time. And then I think we have take to- the form of tax credits given to developers. Is that the mechanism? There's a couple of different mechanisms um, that they would use, but yeah, tax credits, the low income housing tax credit is definitely one of the most popular. I think they've built two and a half million homes with that since it was established. Um, you would think that, I mean, she's not focusing on subsidizing demand, is she? Like, you would think that there would be very predictable ripple effects in the housing market that would, in fact, not be helpful. In so the, the house, the home builders have to build. Oh, the home builders have to build. Yeah. But were there other mechanisms by which she's attempting to um, give financial assistance, especially to first generation home buyers? Yeah. Yeah. She had a whole, I think it was like eight or nine proposals around housing. Um, yeah, I think I've got some of them here, actually. So yeah. this is her agenda to lower costs for American families. One, as you mentioned, calling for the supply or the construction of 3 million new homes over the next four years. Um, I was looking into the historical data there, by the way. Um, and uh, over the past five years, this is according to data compiled by iProperty Management, um, an average of 1.4% roughly new privately owned housing units broke ground annually. Um, 1.5 million is the five-year annual average. So uh, 3 million is actually not a super ambitious target, I, I don't think. No, but, we need like um, eight, 8 million homes. We need a yeah, lot of homes. Uh, but yeah, Liz was mentioning this uh, $25,000 down payment support for first-time homeowners. To me, boy, um, just clear on that for one moment. Like to me, that looks like subsidizing demand. Like to me, that doesn't seem like it will necessarily yeah. help, and in fact, might hurt. Yeah, that is subsidizing demand, but there are policies around expanding supply. I think the thing with the but, down. But can we linger on that first for a second before we get to the other ones? The twenty-five thousand dollar down payment assistance, I think, has gotten a lot of attention because it's like, oh wow, the federal <laughs> government's going to be sending out twenty-five thousand dollar checks or something. What do you think of that specific proposal? Um, you know, from an economic standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I wrote about it in my my newsletter yesterday, and I'm trying to pull that up right now. But um, you know. People will definitely say, like, you can't subsidize demand, especially when we have such a housing crisis that we have now. And I think that's true. Um, it's not really that people need more assistance. But I've done a lot of interviews with the chair of the, the Council of Economic Advisors, Jared Bernstein. And there's something called the pencil out problem, where even if you build affordable housing, those who can't afford housing will not be able to afford that affordable housing. And so some sort of demand side substitution is necessary to get those people across the finish line. Um, but even if you have $25,000 on a down payment, I think even with a $400,000 house, you still need $80,000 for a down payment. And so $25,000 isn't necessarily going to you know, get you across the finish line there either. But yeah, demand side subsidization when we have a supply side problem is not something that we should focus on. But I also think we have to focus on returns. I keep on saying that, but I, 
I just think everyone's not talking about home insurance. I will die on home insurance. I want to be really popular. Home insurance. Honestly, I, I do want to ask you about home insurance in a second. But <laughs> you I, get to talk about it. Give what you want, damn it. Come on. Let's look at a couple of the uh, other Harris uh, proposals here. The first ever tax incentive for building starter homes, which Liz mentioned. Uh, a historic expansion of existing tax incentives for businesses to build rental housing that is affordable, including a new $40 billion innovation fund, um, and then um, cutting red tape and needless bureaucracy, streamlining the permitting process and reviews. On that Seems last one, cool that, issue. I mean, that that's like music to my libertarian ears, although I'm a little bit, I, I don't know how much the federal government has to do with that versus, you know, state and local, but um, it's it's a good instinct. The thing, um, the thing that yeah, annoys me a little bit about some of these proposals, I mean, first of all, yeah, that's not really in the purview of the federal government, though state and local governments certainly take cues from federal government policy when they see um, the head honchos of their party embracing a different approach to permitting, right? Like, I'm sure they'll pay attention and perk up. But the thing that bothers me about so much of the developer incentives um, and the building new housing, like, yes, that is absolutely true that that is important and in fact required. But fundamentally, like we're going to be experiencing this massive lag because, right, like this will, you know, get started as soon as Harris uh, takes office if if she wins. And then when is the soonest that these homes will actually be <laughs> occupied by the people who need them? And then there's also the other thing, which I think uh, missing middle housing proponents yeah. talk a lot about this, but I also think like we can't be agnostic as to like the types of housing um, that, that are being built. And I think one thing that's been especially interesting has been the degree to which de developers sort of aren't building starter homes the way that they sort of used to. And so there's like all of these weird little pockets of needs where because like people aren't just, it's not just that there's like one type of house that fits everybody's needs, um, but rather, and, and I, I want to trust the market to deliver for people what they want, but like even looking around at like New York City rental properties, you can find a lot of one bedrooms, you can find a lot of two bedrooms, but then when you get into like that three bedroom that's still within a, a reasonable price range, the, the, the likes of which a family with two kids or three kids might want, that kind of thing, you you really get bumped up into needing an entire brownstone or needing an entire townhome in a way that's just like not accessible. And there's so many examples of that, not just in New York City's housing market, but all over the place, right? And so the type of housing that is being built definitely matters. And then also like starter homes specifically, right? Like it's a lot harder to find that 1,000 square foot single family home in a mid-sized city than it used to be in 1990. Kyla, what do you make of that? I just threw a million things. Yeah. No, no, all, all great points. Yeah, mis missing middle is so important. Townhomes, duplexes, triplexes. Um, it's something that we don't really spend a lot of time thinking about or investing in. Um, and then I also think that housing supply is really important. That missing middle of housing is really important. Um, and it's something that people are thinking about. But the issue is, is that the home builders also are struggling with capacity. Like lumber is kind of an issue. Labor costs are a big issue. And so even if we have all of these policies that can be passed around housing, um, it's not like Builders can go out there and build them in some cases. Joe Weisenthal out of Bloomberg has talked about that too. And so I think there, like you were saying, like there's all these pockets of need and all these pockets of problems in the housing market that are creating this massive, massive issue. And right. if you ascribe to the housing theory of everything, which is, you know, how people feel about their ability to get housing <laughs> impacts literally everything that they do. Um, and it impacts like their health, it impacts how, how they make interest they have and when yeah. you have them, right. right? And like, and it's like from home, whether or not you can have a flexible childcare situation, like right. there's a million things. That yeah. Happen, and no right? wonder we have a demographic crisis. We have a housing crisis. The two things, they're intertwined. Yeah. The, my worry, my sort of high level worry with this approach to it, though, uh, I mean, I'm in full agreement that there seems to be a housing shortage and especially in big cities, it's not affordable for young people to to find places to live. Using um, tax incentives, uh, just the tax system generally to try to encourage certain kinds of housing and discourage other sorts of housing, um, the, this idea that, you know, we need to build more housing, I think is a little bit, it, it runs the risk of unintended consequences and creating bubbles that, uh, mm. that like we, I, I think this partially happened in the last housing crisis, that there were certain initiatives 
to the, you know well-meaning initiatives to push people into mortgages that then blew up. And if you're not having, uh, if if it's if it's not a true market demand that you're meeting, and instead you're kind of tipping the scale towards certain kinds of housing or against certain other kinds of housing instead of just simply deregulating land use, that you're going to run that risk of just creating asset bubbles again. Um, yeah, I, that... mean, I, I think now the prices are so elevated that there is like a sense of demand there. Like there is a market that would be met if we freed up some housing. Like that would, I think, be the big difference rather than giving mortgages to people who are obviously not able to finance it. And like lending standards have really tightened since 2008. So I think that sort of financial crisis would be avoided. But yeah, I, I think that there's other pockets of the economy that could make homes apps. I think homes are always at risk of being a bubble just because, yeah. of, you know, we treat them as investment tools and anything that's associated with investment has the opportunity to get bubbly. Tell me about the home in the, the <laughs> old home insurance plays and all this. Well, so like you can't have a mortgage if you don't have insurance. And so in, um, I think in New York, it, it was 32 or no, in the whole country, 32% of buyers were all cash in January, 2024. So that mm -hmm. means the other 68% needed a mortgage. And so if you're an all cash buyer, you can self-insure, like you don't have to worry about any insurance, but if you have a mortgage, the only way that you're going to be able to take out the mortgage is if you work with an insurer and insurers are pulling out of states like California, Florida, Louisiana, and, um, they are like, sorry, Good luck. And the only options that those homeowners had now have is a government program, which is not as comprehensive and is much more expensive. And we are not really talking about this when we talk about expanding supply. And I think when we talk about expanding supply of housing, we have to have a plan for insurance in place as well. Because if State Farm and Allstate and the like Berkshire are all pulling out and saying, like, sorry, good luck. You know, yeah. the government is going to have to backstop this. And that's a whole, that's a crisis. So hold on yeah, here. I, but it, so as they pull out, though, they're not saying I mean, they, they are saying sorry, good luck. But they're also saying something else. Like, correct me if I'm wrong here. They're saying something else, which is why would you live in this place that is so prone to flooding? Yeah. And realistically, like we're trying to give you a signal yeah, um, yeah. that this place is prone to flooding and you should not live here. And a house probably should never have been built here or that this place is prone to wildfires. And they're making this rational choice and attempting to sort of like act in in aggregate, right, to try to send a message to somebody. And so, it, you know, it puts the seller of that, the house that's in a prone area in a very, very tough spot. But to some degree, it's like they're making a rational decision and attempting to provide information to would-be buyers. Like, what do you make of I've seen yeah. it up close, Liz, because I've lived in Florida and California, yeah. and both of those places exactly. are where insurers are, are fleeing because of that reason where uh, all this coastal property is not insurable except at a very high rate. And then in California, the wildfires and earthquakes are an issue. You know, the, all the earthquake insurance is like it's it's a whole other market. Well, um, but, I, live in yeah, idiot, but, at least I live on a peninsula at the bottom of New York City in Queens where I'm um, like literally a few feet away from the Jamaica Bay on one side and then the Atlantic Ocean on the other side. Like we're sandwiched in between. Yeah. This is simply not a place like this place might not exist in 50 years. Yeah. Um, and it would be a little bit insane for me to attempt to make it so or to have insurers be on the hook for that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And insurers are they're also losing money. So, of course, you're yeah. not going to stay. They lost $15.2 billion last year. That was double their losses from the year prior. And so I think insurers are definitely saying like, hey, guys, like you really can't live in Miami. <laughs> like it's just not going yeah. to work. Um, but the issue is that those are usually economic hotspots because that's where economy started was like on these coastlines, but the coastlines eroding. Like it's it's just not working anymore, and so, so I, I think the states just like stop doing this. Then because I mean I I feel like in some sense Florida would just be better would have been better off if they had never sort of backstopped the insurers this way yeah. and created so the special nice. fund for the coastal mm -hmm. properties, and then the rich people who want to live on the coast can just pay for their own risk yeah. level. Yeah. yeah, I mean if that's what they want to do, that's totally fine. I yeah. think the the other problem is, uh, you know, states like California have a cap on how much insurance can go up. And so most Californias are not 
pay, Californians are not paying off in insurance. And Which is crazy. Like, why would the state of California do this, right? Like, it is well, important that the amount of risk that you are assuming and that the insurer is assuming on your behalf is reflected in how much you pay, right? But that makes like, people mad and not vote for <laughs> you. And so... It's like, um, the, like the political, like, the explosive political nature of, like, touching anything related to entitlement. Yeah. Like, God forbid yeah. you, like begin to address the social security and, and float the idea of like raising the retirement age, but like you will piss off all of the old voters. And guess what? That's the demographic, yeah. game, right? Like, but to, at some point we just have to confront reality. Your house is going to burn down, right? Like, yeah, or fall into the ocean. I mean, houses are falling into the ocean. Like that's the thing. Like we see this happening in real time, but you know, the, the insurers are like, okay, we can't raise rates in California. So we'll raise rates in a state that doesn't have a lot of regulation like Oklahoma. Yeah. So Enid, Oklahoma, which does experience tornadoes, has the highest insurance premium in the entire country. It's like a tiny, tiny little town. And it's because the insurers can't raise rates in places like California. And so they'll raise prices on people in other states that don't have that same sort of regulatory barrier. And that's also problematic too, because then you're it's all sorts of subsidization that shouldn't be happening. And it's it's not, it doesn't work. I love but that California made, politicians have found a way to fuck over the citizens of Oklahoma, right? Like that's so impressive <laughs> that they managed to do that. This idea that you raise that, uh, well, it's because the voters don't like that. That's why they don't <laughs> do it. I, I feel like we are just rolling more and more towards that uh, that mindset um that, that that's how i feel when i watch um kamala harris talk about uh price gouging yeah, anti-price gouging measures or price caps um in fact we did we did pull a clip of her talking about that i'd like to just roll that clip for a second and reflect on where we are politically when we think about economics could you roll that john when I am elected president, I will make it a top priority to bring down costs and increase economic security for all Americans. As president, I will take on the high costs that matter most to most Americans, like the cost of food. We all know that prices went up during the pandemic when the supply chains shut down and failed. But our supply chains have now improved. And prices are still too high. A, lo a loaf of bread cost 50% more today than it did before the pandemic. Ground beef is up almost 50%. Many of the big food companies are seeing their highest profits in two decades. And while Many grocery chains pass along these savings. Others still aren't. Look, I know most businesses are creating jobs, contributing to our economy, and playing by the rules. But some are not. And that's just not right. And we need to take action when that is the case. At Attorney General in California, I went after companies that illegally increased prices, including wholesalers that inflated the price of prescription medication, and companies that conspired with competitors to keep prices of electronics high. I won more than $1 billion for consumers. me as president, I will go after the bad actors. All right. So um, and I shouldn't I'm not only picking on Kamala Harris. I mean, she's actually pretty good when she talks about uh, Donald, the effect that Donald Trump's tariffs will have on the consumer and the sort of disconnect there between Trump saying he's going to bring down prices, but also levy a 10 percent tariff across the board and 60 percent on China, which she characterizes as a uh, na uh, as in effect a national sales tax. But we do seem to be in a very populist, ignore the economists type of moment. In fact, that was a headline in a recent Atlantic article, like Kamala Harris's right to just ignore the economists for saying price caps are bad. Um, 
how do you feel watching a clip like that and the the moment uh, that we're in? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the reaction that most people had to her talking about price gouging was like, well, how do you respond to price gouging? And one of the main ways is price caps. And so you make it so grocers can't raise prices beyond a certain point. But what that does is mess up the supply and demand curve and create shortages. Because if you're telling somebody that they can only supply cantaloupes at $3, but they really need to have $5 cantaloupes, they're not going to have cantaloupes. And so I think that's kind of part of the issue that is um, one of the ways to go about it wouldn't work. I think that there's other ways to make it more competitive. Like, you know, Kroger is trying to buy Albertsons for, um, I don't even know how much money, but they were like, we, we will do $1 billion in price cuts if you let us merge with this other giant grocery chain. And so there's obviously like a little bit of room for price manipulation at the grocery stores. Um, Walmart also supplies, I think, one third of all groceries in the country. So they're a very large brand. And so there's room for competition and competition is a natural way for prices to go down. But I don't think something like instating price caps would be a good solution. And I also think right now, on the campaign trail, um, it's a lot of posturing, a lot of sentiment, a lot of stuff that will never happen. Like the unrealized capital gains tax, it's never going to pass. It's just a lot of talk. Um, why shouldn't Kroger be allowed to buy Albertsons? Um, it, it just wouldn't give consumers all the choices that they would need. Basically, a lot of rural towns would just have a Kroger to go to. Some towns have both a Kroger and an Albertsons. Um, usually you do want to encourage competition because that is a natural way for, you know, monopolies to not take over. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's like, that's the the tough thing I always have with this antitrust conversation is the sort of wide latitude or definition that, you know, the word monopoly being thrown around when there's, it's really, there really is not a, grocery monopoly, even, you know, where we heard a lot about the tech monopolies five years ago, now that tech is being shaken up by the the introduction of AI, all that. Well, whole, nobody caring, con- right? Yeah, that like, whole conversation nobody- has, has changed and you don't hear so much talk about tech monopolies anymore. Now it's uh, grocery store monopolies, um, even though, you know, there's that like Kroger and Albertsons merging would not be e- even you know, it wouldn't even start to approach 50% of the market. Um, I believe Sam's Club would still be, have a bigger share of the market than those two combined. So what is that threshold where suddenly two companies merging becomes too big of a threat to competition? So I spent a little bit of time thinking about this because my little brother works in Kroger corporate. And so like, we'll talk a lot about what does it look like in the grocery store land? And it's definitely tough and I, I think that the response to monopolies like tech monopolies are a little bit different because they were never really monopolies except for app, the app store but or and even that's not really a monopoly because android but I, I would say that it's kind of worry of like how do local stores get their foot off the ground like it's very difficult to be a small local grocery store they tried to establish this grocery store in i think cairo indiana um, or maybe it was Cairo, Illinois, and I'm just saying the city name wrong, but it was called the Rise Grocery Store. And it was like this local store that, you know, uh, got fresh produce in. It was meant to compete with Dollar Generals and it just could survive. It was just way too <laughs> expensive. And so I think some people worry about that. Like if everything does be like the U.S. is known to be three corporations in a trench coat. And if that does actually take over, like what does that mean for small businesses and in those jobs and it's all it's very spe- it's all very speculative though i mean like the, i mean that's economics isn't the isn't the, me- isn't the metric shouldn't it be something like are they actually you know hiking prices or or their profit margins are going crazy specifically because there's no competitor in the market i mean you can have a dominant player in the market and prices still be going down and that's not even really a problem from a consumer perspective. Right? Yeah. No, I don't think it's the right thing to go after the grocery stores. I, I really think it's the food manufacturers right. that are, if there is any sort of issue with prices, it, it's them. 
because grocery store margins are razor thin, like I think it's one to 2%, if that. Um, and yeah, so it's definitely manufacturers that would have to get a closer look. Like I know Nestle owns a lot of nature food brands. And so like yeah. maybe there's something to look at there. Kyla, I don't understand. If you're so good at econ and so smart about economics, why aren't you a libertarian? Um, I don't really like, to, this is a cop answer, <laughs> but I don't really like to have labels. Like I really try. So you are a libertarian because that's what all of the libertarians <laughs> did. They hit like, oh, no labels, man. <laughs> no labels. No, no I mean, I just, horrible. I, I, I've been bad about it lately, but I really try to like just do objective economics education as much as I can. I don't think my big opinion on what things are doing like matters that much. Like I just try to educate as much as possible. And I I think that like there is a role for government. Um, but I, I like this home insurance thing that I'm obsessed with (laughs) has really, um, frustrated me because like we're ignoring a very big problem. I think healthcare is a very big problem, but I don't know if the private market is the right solution. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I just, I, I guess I still have more questions than answers. And so but, that's probably why I have ascribed a label to myself. So you're just sort of calling balls and strikes like you see them. That makes I sense. I try to. Do you, do you have a sense that like, does it disturb you um, looking around and seeing people roughly our age having, I mean, I don't want to call them stupid, right? Because that's like very sneering and condescending, but like there's, there's seemingly this like lack of thinking through unintended consequences and um, this almost very surface level understanding of economics. And it makes a lot of sense because when I think back about like, you know, education in middle school and high school and college, it, there was a lot of opportunity to opt into classes on econ, but it wasn't exactly something that was um, sort of like re- required or even routine. Like, are you worried about sort of like low IQ economic thinking, especially among young people? So I grew up in Kentucky and I didn't even know that economics was a major until I got to college. And so I think it's just about accessibility and it's about giving them people information. Um, and so I do worry about that. Like, that's why I wrote that book. That's why I do these videos online. Um, that's why I talk to the White House is because it's like uh, <laughs> people need to know kind of what's happening around them. Like, if you want to make a system better, you have to understand how the system works. And so I think that people oftentimes do opt out of education. That is no question. But oftentimes they might not even know where to get that information. And it, it can be... Economics is so highbrow sometimes it's not accessible. Like they, they, it's a lot of gate kept language. It's a lot of people that do not want other people participating in that conversation. And that's really difficult to get your foot into the door. And I guess sometimes yeah. you also like pursue education and economics, but you still end up like an MMT, MMT guy, right? So like, what's yeah. the, <laughs> the well, opinion, opinion always leaks in because you're a person participating in the economy. It's impossible for you not to have an opinion on what's happening. Like I have a big opinion on housing because as a young person, that's what I'm extraordinarily worried about for, you know, our generation. And it's like, I don't know what we're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very admirable that you're trying to break down these concepts (laughs) and put them out on social media for those generations who are, for whatever reason, that gap in economics education, I've never understood why it's not emphasized in uh, K through 12 schools. Even uh, personal given that finance it, seemed like something that was like taught in schools in the 60s and 70s. And then now like you could just not know how to budget or. Which is crazy. We yeah. per- expect people to, to participate in the economy and don't tell them about it. Yeah. yeah. But as someone who is speaking to that generation, um, I am curious what you, what your evaluation is of uh, first of all, how, how the message is being received and, and where Gen Z is kind of poised to take things. I noticed you made it some commentary on this TikTok clip that went viral of um, a mm-hmm. Gen Z employee. It was her first ever job, I guess, her first ever nine to five, and she was not taking it well. So let's just roll that clip, and I'd love mm-hmm. to get your reaction and like take on this whole this whole incident. Sure. I know I'm probably just being so dramatic and annoying. 
but this is my first job like my first nine to five job after college and i'm in person and i'm commuting in the city and it takes me fucking forever to get there there's no way i'm gonna be able to afford living in the city right now so that's off the table like fucking duh if i was able to walk to work and it, it'd be fine but i'm not so it literally takes me like i leave here at, like i get on the train at 7 30 and i don't get home till like 6 15 earliest and then like i don't have time to do anything i don't i want to shower eat my dinner and go to sleep i don't have time or energy to cook my dinner either like i don't have energy to work out like that's out the window like i'm so upset oh my god nothing to do with my job at all but just like the nine to five schedule in general is crazy being in the office nine to five like if it was remote you get off at five and you're home and everything's fine but like i'm not home it takes me long to get home and like like people that drive to the office like it doesn't you don't get off at five and i know it could be worse i know i could be working longer but like i literally get off it's pitch black like i don't have energy how do you have friends like how do you have time to like meet like a guy i don't know like how do you have time for like dating like i don't have time for anything and i'm like so stressed out and i'm also getting my period so that's why i'm all emotional but like (laughs) am i so dramatic it's fine this is this was roundly mocked, and Liz is over there uh, covering her face. But then you had a different reaction, Kyla. What did you? What was your reaction to that? Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I feel bad for. Yeah, when my first job out of college, I had to be in the office at like four a.m. because I was on the buy side in Los Angeles, and we had oh, to work wow. East Coast hours. So I, I get it, but like. Um, I think also I wrote this big piece in February about the lack of trust that young people have in institutions. You know, there was a poll from uh, Harvard showing that young people just don't trust anything anymore. There's a lot of nihilism. And I think what she's talking about kind of ties into that. Like, I think for the boomer generation, you kind of would work at a job for 40 years. You would sometimes get a pension. Like it, it was kind of solid. And I think for younger people, you're sort of patching together that kind of stuff. You're usually saddled with some element of student loan debt, which is a whole issue within itself. Um, Housing costs are really high. You know, food costs are high. Uh, Cost of living is simply high. And so I think that it makes sense that she's feeling that frustration um, because I think for a lot of people, it doesn't feel like there's a way out. Like that's your life, you know. How do you think that Gen Z, how, how, this, I, if we can take her as a proxy for a certain type of Gen Z employee who is just looking at the workplace differently and reacting and sort of like uh, yearning for a remote job where she doesn't have to do a commute, um, how do you, is that going to somehow change the workplace? We've already seen the workplace get transformed uh through during the pandemic i think that accelerated a lot of trends that were already in motion um but it's definitely you know the the rise of remote work is uh uh some of that has been durable um how do you think gen z is gonna interface with the workplace like in the longer term so i wrote a piece on this with fast company about a year ago also and it was kind of about this. Uh, I think that Gen Z is it's going to be tough because the, they were in college during online for most of them. And I think a lot of them are not used to having to be in office. Like I graduated into the pandemic. I was in the office for like six months maybe where the <laughs> pandemic happened. And that totally changed my relationship with work. And I also yeah. think that there seems to be a desire for the younger generations to have work that surrounds a passion, like something that you deeply care about, um, versus I think boomers were like fine doing a true nine to five where it was like, I, you know, totally compartmentalized from, from my job. And there's a Wall Street Journal article that talks about Gen Z being the tool belt generation and like them going to trade school and like doing all this stuff. And I think that's great. And I would like to see more of that, but I think, you know, in the same way that the housing promise seems to be crumbling, so does the college education promise it's just maybe it doesn't get you as far as it did prior but don't so many of these issues have to do with unrealistic expectations i know that's like a very boomery um response to have to that video but like that woman crying very theatrically and then broadcasting it to unknown numbers of people it just strikes me as like 
you, so what, you leave your house at 7.30, you get back at 6.15? Like, what? I'm a mom. I'm on the clock all the time. I was on the clock at 4 a.m. last night, right? Like, it, it's just, and, and most people in high-powered jobs um, in any sort of major city or the metropolitan area of any major city, like, yeah, those hours are not especially egregious, right? Like, this is sort of a thing that we have long accepted, and we also haven't necessarily attached the idea of, like, this has to be missional work. Um, this has to be work where yeah. we find fulfillment in it. Like sometimes, especially when you graduate and you're first starting out, like you do jobs that you do not like. Sometimes you do multiple jobs at once. Sometimes you work hours that you do not like or in a setting that you do not like. And like you live in a place that's not your favorite and not to attempt to force people into this like dues paying type of thing, this idea of like, you know, we all did it. And so therefore you have to like, I think it would be great if we could just like, you know, move further past that. And if that were an avoidable part of life, but like, it strikes me as an unrealistic expectation, people being like, oh, I will get the pay that I want and the job composition that I want and a high degree of fulfillment from it and a high degree of stability and the market will just happen to value this work super highly and I'll find the perfect match immediately. Like, like how much of this has to do with just like a very pie in the sky image of work? A lot. And that's exacerbated by social media where you get online and you see people who are influencers and their job is getting in a plane, right? And so yeah. I think for a lot of people, they're like, well, why couldn't that be me? Like, why couldn't I have the aspirational lifestyle? And if you're constantly going on TikTok and filming a video of you being upset about work, you're probably scrolling also. And so yeah. you're absorbing all of those ideas about a world beyond what some would consider to be hard work, right? And kind of a quote, unquote, easy life. But that's like 1% of people. And I, I think that we, because of social media, it seems more sort of common that it is, and people Perfect. get in their head that it's a realistic expectation. Well, it's sometimes very hard to figure out whether or not these like purported influencers are actually making a significant amount of money doing the thing that they're doing, right? Like I think about the uh, Treadwife influencer, Ballerina Farm, who's basically the only quote unquote influencer that I pay attention to. And it's like, she's bankrolled by an extremely wealthy husband whose dad is like the CEO of, I think, Tap Air. Jeff and oh, I thought it was Jeff. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Maybe both, or maybe he's served on the board of one. But like, regardless, like, you know, airline magnet and family money. And so it's like, it's not as if it's, uh, you know, paid partnership, spawn, spawn con that's paying, you know, for their 17 children or whatever, right? And like, to some degree, it's like, maybe we need to wake up to the fact that like a lot of what we are glimpsing is kind of an illusion and not attainable in any way. Although I do have to say that I sort of shared Kyla's like counter reaction to seeing some of these uh, tech CEOs and stuff <laughs> dunking on yeah. her and saying like, you know, just suck it up, sweetie. Like I, I have, I have, uh, you know, some sympathy for her. That's a it, it can be hard when you're just out of college, you're you're new to the workforce. And and also just like the idea yeah. that like it's always been this way, so it's always going to be that way is cool. like we don't want to be so rigid about it. Like the market has um provided, you know, better, you know, well, putting aside like uh government regulations, just on a purely like market uh, uh process. We've seen the workforce, the way people have worked, the kind of hours they work have have changed over time because of the material improvements that the market provides. And my hope would be that uh, there would be, you know, the kind of the, those kind of jobs that you're talking about, Kyla, where you're able where people are able to find some sense of mission mm -hmm. and also like, you know, the, the flexibility is an increasingly valuable part of the compensation package for a lot of people. Yeah. And if we want people to have kids, we have to give them that sort of flexibility. Right. Yeah. Right. Like childcare is so expensive. But this is also sort of part of the working life cycle, I think. I think I would feel differently if it was as if people were, you know, relegated to these grueling um, and very inflexible, very rigid jobs for the duration of their working careers. But I sort of see it as a little bit of like, oh, well, that's what we deal with when we're 22, 23. And then by the time we have... Um, logged a few years and built a reputation for ourselves. We've moved to maybe a different vertical at the same workplace or a different one. And like slowly but surely as we become paid for our judgment um, versus being a body in a chair, uh, we suddenly just get more leverage over our work situation. Like more things are negotiable when you are more valuable, which is a very like um, sort of like crude way of putting it. But I think that like for whatever reason, like, you know, of course the 22 year old has way less um, 
sort of like ability to dictate the terms of her work than a 29 year old would and then a 40 year old would and then a 50 year old would would like that to me it's like you take on a different um role over the course of your working life cycle and for whatever reason it seems like a lot of gen z's kind of work themselves into a tizzy over the fact that like they don't have the leverage that they want to at the age of 23. And this is how you create uh, future DSA members. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Kyla, I want to ask you the uh, question of the show, which uh, is in keeping with our theme. What is a question that you think more people should be asking? What's going to happen with home insurance? <laughs> 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 That's the only time in the history of man that somebody has made a joke out of COVID, <laughs> like COVID starts as the punchline. I gosh, I yeah, I think it's I, I hope I'm like overstating it in my head and like it's it's gonna be okay. But then I've been like really you know how you get in a research rabbit hole and it's like all you yeah. talk about and people are like, go sit her in a corner and so she shuts up. It's like home insurance, I just think is going it's so important, especially because we're talking so much about housing supply. It's like we mm -hmm. cannot have that conversation about home insurance and so yeah that's my my one question <laughs> home insurance look into it people kyla <laughs> scanlon thank you very much for joining us on just asking so questions it's having me thanks for listening to just asking questions these conversations appear on reason's youtube channel and the just asking questions podcast feed every thursday subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show